And so this will become clearer through the talk. OK, so basically what I'm going to talk about is the is transferable utility collectional games. I'll talk a little bit, bit about non-transferable utility games toward the end of the talk. Right? So we've, we've seen some examples yesterday. Right? So these are games where we have a bunch of players. Players can form coalitions. Right? So finite set of players, they form coalitions. Each coalition can earn some payoff, kind of monetary payoff. So let's assume throughout the talk that it's non-negative. Right? So these five guys get together, they earn $15. Right, and then, yeah. then the payoff needs to be split among the members of a among members of the coalition. Right, then, so the usual questions you ask in the context of coalitional games are the following: first, potentially, okay, so often we're interested in super additive games where it's sort of where players can only do better by merging all together. But if not, if we don't have that property, then the most basic question you can ask, what is the optimal split of players into the coalitions? How do you partition them into groups so as to maximize social wel welfare? OK, so next question, which you can ask both for additive, both for super additive and non super additive games, can you distribute the payoffs among the players in a stable fashion? Stable meaning no group of players wants to deviate. So for those of you who are not familiar with these concepts, I'll, I'll give formal definitions later in the talk. Right, and another possible criterion for distributing payoffs would be fairness. Fairness as distinct from stability means we want to distribute payoffs so that each player somehow is paid in proportion to his or her contribution. Right, so these are kind of three basic computational tasks. Right, and these tend to be hard. So generally, transferable utility collectional games are a complicated object, right? Because we have a lot of collections, right? So we have a lot of numerical values. It's not even clear how to represent them compactly. So they're not that easy to work with, right? So one thing that sometimes makes collectional games simpler, right, and also arguably more realistic, is to assume that players actually sit on a graph, right? So this is what the term social networks in the title of the talk refers to. Right, so it, I don't just have players. I also have some sort of network stru structure over them. Right, and now my rule is that to form a coalition, kind of a group of players needs to be connected. Right, so only connected coalitions are valid. Okay, so what does it actually mean? So what does it mean for disconnected coalitions? Well, there are two ways to think about them. Let me give them somewhat arbitrary names after, after two famous game theories. I'll later explain where the names come from. Right, so let me go with that. Okay, so this is an example. So on top, we have a connected collision, so it does earn value. On the bottom, we have a disconnected collision, so bad collision. Right? So what can I say? What do I want to say about bad collisions? Let me say that I'm dealing with a Demange game after Gabriel Demange. If I, say, if I give a value of zero to each disconnected collision, right? So if you are disconnected, you just don't count, you don't earn payoffs. So another option named after Myerson, Myerson games is that if I have a disconnected collision, right, so it's not as stark. I simply look at its connected components. Right, I look at the values of these connected components and add them up. Right, so now the value of the yellow collision, instead of being 0, is the sum of the values of these three components. Right, so these names are somewhat arbitrary, but not quite. So I'll later explain kind of which papers I associate them with. OK, so now we have this network structure. OK, so can we get some mileage out of it? Right, so now the idea, of course, if my network is completely arbitrary, so in particular it can be a complete graph, I'm not going to get anything out of assuming the network structure. But suppose my graph is nice. Right, so can, may, can I maybe get now some easiness results for collational games? Kind of existence results for solution concepts, computational easiness results. Well, OK. So let me, let me state this question more formally. So I start with a game, kind of without a graph. So I have a, I have a set of players and a characteristic function. So I take a graph. Out of that, I get a Demange game and a Myerson game. Right? So from the same base graph, so the same, the same base game and the same graph is, can be associated with these two games. Right? And they differ in how they assign values to disconnected collisions. Right? And now, yeah, so the question I want to ask is, how does the structure of the graph help in finding good outcomes for both of these games? OK, so what would be our first attempt? So what are the best, best graphs that we know? Trees. Well, complete graphs, we already know they're bad, right? So com complete graphs are kind of as bad as the general case. So I want good graphs. I, would I want graphs that make my life easy, right? And those would be trees. So by the way, so what do I assume about the representation of the game? 
let me assume Oracle access to the characteristic function, right? And I want a small number of queries to this Oracle function. Okay, trees. Right, so trees is a good first attempt, and indeed there is a positive result in the literature. Right, so this is the one that, name, that gave the name to one of my game classes. So there is a result by Dimanche saying that if the underlying graph is a tree, then the associated game, well, the Dimanche game, but the result would also hold for my awesome game. Then the associated game has a non-empty core. Right, okay, so this is nice. Right, in fact, right, so this is a positive result. So in general, games may have empty cores. Right, but if the game is played on a tree, it has a non-empty core. In fact, it's even an algorithmic result, except, okay, so it's an algorithmic result in the sense that it constructs an outcome in the core. This algorithm is even polynomial time if you're dealing with a superadditive game, but not if the game is not superadditive, right? So it's a positive result, it's a positive algorithmic result, but in a somewhat limited sense. Okay, so the question now is, can you push it much further? Well, Okay, so can you go, so if you have a positive result for trees, so what would be the natural next step? Bounded tree bits. Uh, no, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so V of union great, greater equal than V of one plus V of the other. Disjoint union, yeah. So I'm just talking about disjoint unions now. Right, and if you don't have that, right, or so it's, if it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so restri restricted to connected, right, yeah so, I, yeah, so I have to be more careful, so the notion of superadditivity has to be stated appropriately for games on graphs, but yeah, so this is kind of what your intuition tells you it is. But uh, I thought that you have the game first, and then only change the values of the qualities when they're destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so yeah, so you can start with a superadditive game and kind of, and ask what happens to it, superadditive or non-superadditive. Okay, so, okay, so can you... Can you move to bounded tree bits? No, so there's a fairly recent result that many correlated questions, including constructing outcome in the core, are hard even for, for tree bits too. Right, so you cannot push it much further. Okay, so this is stability, Shapley value. Sh okay, so I haven't found this result in the literature, but it's so easy that someone should have thought about it before me. So Shapley value remains hard on trees. So why is that? Well, a star is a tree, so let me give you the following characteristic function. There is exactly one collision, including the center and some subset of leaves, that has non-zero value. And everything else has zero value, has zero value. Right? Or possibly, in, indeed, all collisions have zero value. Right? So, to f so if all collisions have zero value, everyone's Shapley value is zero. If there is this one interesting collision, then players in that collision have non-zero Shapley value. And you pretty much have to query every collision to figure out which is which. So it's sort of communication complexity lower bound. Right, so you have to query pretty much everything. Right, so if you, if you want to make it monotone, you can. Right, so if that bothers you. Right, so Shapley value remains hard in the, sense of, in the sense that you need a lot of queries. Okay, so for those of you who don't, who don't know or don't remember the definition of Shapley value, we'll cover those soon enough. Okay, so this is kind of, for those of you who are familiar actually with solution concepts for cooperative games, so I'm sorry doing it somewhat out of order. Okay. So, okay, so trees give you some mileage, but you are not getting, but we are not getting very far, right? So, we, so even Demonge's algorithm is limited, so we get hardness for fairness, right? So we cannot progress beyond trees. So what I want to do in this talk is to look at another parameter of graphs, right? And this is the number of connected collisions, right? So I want bounds in terms of the number of connected collisions. Okay, so here's my observation. Right, so again, so this is for those of you who are, who are familiar at least with the notion of the core, and I think this is a substantial chunk of this audience. Right, so the core is defined, the core is defined in terms of kind of constraints on collisions, right, so payoffs, of, payoffs to collisions. So if you have polynomially many connected collisions, polynomially many interesting collisions, then an outcome in the core can be found in polynomial time. So basically your linear program has polynomially many constraints. Right, so this is for Dimanche games, so more or less the same holds for Myerson games. Right, so, so this, is, this seems to be a useful parameter, the number of connected collisions. Okay, so, and also actually, if you look at Dimanche's algorithm for non-superadditive games, so you can bound its running time again in the number of connected subtrees, right, so number of connected collisions. So this seems to, so there are some preliminary indications that this is a relevant parameter, right, so the question I want to ask is, well, exactly how relevant it is. Okay, so first, okay, so I claim this result for Dimanche games, 
Well, does it also hold for Myers and games? OK, so for this specific question, it's sort of trivial. Yes, what about other solution concepts? Right, so I sort of want to ask systematically, look at, give, consider a computational question for transferable utility games. Does this question become easy if my graph has polynomial and many connected collisions? Yeah? Right. But that means you're getting that if you've already got those that you're connecting the mice from one of each individual connected component. Right. So you're satisfied also satisfying the constraints of D zero and vice versa. Right? right, yeah. So for the core for the core they are they indeed behave in the same way. So there will be other solution concepts for which there's actually a difference. Oh, okay. So for the core, yes, your intuition is exactly correct. OK, so second, what are these graphs, right? So what are these graphs that have polynomial and many connected collisions, right? And probably those of you who have some background in graph theory sort of have the intuition that these are essentially trivial graphs, but the question is exactly how trivial, right? So this is something that I want to understand. So by the way, so I, I searched the literature long and hard to see if this is known. It, I couldn't find any results, but if any of you happen to know kind of if this is out under some other name, please let me know. OK, and the third question, which may seem sort of viewed at this point, but my, this is a question of whether this is actually about, is this actually about graphs? Or is this simply, or perhaps the graph structure does not matter. And what matters is that I have a very small, a small number of interesting collisions, right? Polynomially, polynomially many interesting collisions, but right? No, no, just, yeah, just connected collisions. So when the star already has exponentially many indeed. Right, so as soon as you have a vertex of high degree, so we'll get to that in a second, and high means super algorithmic, right, you already have many. Right, OK, so is, is this really about graphs, or is it about the number of interesting collisions? Right, and so, and I hope to essentially answer all three questions in this talk, right, and then maybe talk a little bit about what's beyond transferable utility games. OK, so first, let me state the answers to question one. Right, so I have this parameter, the number of connected subgraphs, right, so, OK, so what are the computational problems I want to look at? Well, if the game is not super additive, I want to find an optimal partition. Then I may want to check if an outcome is in the core. I may want to check if the core is non-empty. I may want to find out the value of the least core or the cost of stability, also known as the value of the weak least core. I may want to compute the Shapley value. I may want to compute the nucleolus. Right? So we talked about nucleolus a, bit, a little bit yesterday. OK, turns out that for Dimanche games, so all of these questions are easy when k is small, right? So all of them admit algorithms whose running time is polynomial in k. And for Myers and games, I get almost the same result, except for the nucleolus. I have a constraint similar to the one we've seen yesterday, right? So if the core is non-empty, then I can find the nucleolus. If the core may be empty, then I don't know. OK, so these are the results. OK, so to actually talk about these results, so I have to I think I cannot assume that everyone here knows the basic concepts of collisional game theory. So I want to spend the next sort of five, seven minutes kind of giving a quick tour of the basic concepts. So let me do that now. You mean the ho kind of, kind of for, for this case? Yeah, yeah. No, no. So it just, yeah, so it becomes difficult to work with, difficult enough that I don't know how to get a hardness proof, but yeah. I don't know. Okay, so okay, so yes, yeah, so I don't, I don't need, I don't need any any new definitions to talk about finding optimal partitions. So I need definitions for stability-related concepts and fairness-related concepts. So let me do those. Okay, so what is stability? So intuitively, an outcome is stable. So what is an outcome first? Right, an outcome is a partition of players into collisions, and then each collision has to divide the payoffs that it got. Right, so what does it mean for an outcome to be stable? Intuitively, no group of players should be able to profitably deviate. Right, and the way you capture it mathematically, let me restrict myself to super additive games just for this slide for convenience. So the results in the paper are general, but just for the purpose of presentation. Right, so we just have the grand collision. The grand collision collaborates and divides payments. So the outcome is effectively a vector x, payoff division for the grand collision. Right, and it's stable if for every group of players C, it holds that what they're being paid now under x is at least what they could get by deviating. Right? So we've got all these constraints. So for each collision, we get a constraint, right? exponentially many of those. OK, so this is the core. 
I can relax that by epsilon and say that no collision can gain more than epsilon by deviating. Just put an epsilon in each constraint. Right, so this is sort of assuming some sort of stickiness. Right, then I can say, okay, so what is the minimum value of, so if my core is empty, what is the minimum value of epsilon that makes the core non-empty? Right, okay, so, so this is called the value of the least core. Right, so I may want to compute that. Right, so what is the, if you can think of it as what is the minimal penalty I have to impose on deviating to make deviation not worthwhile? Right, so the value of the least core. Right, so this is one of the things that we will be interested in. So further, so the nucleolus is this, uh, I'm not going to define it formally, it's the scary beast we've seen yesterday. It's defined, it's intuitively the most stable point, the most stable point in the core. So the core is, the core is the set of all stable outcomes, so the core may be, so the core may be empty potentially, but it's not, if it's not empty, the center of the core, if it's empty, the center of the least core, the most stable outcome whether it's actually stable or not depends on the gain. Right? It's computed by a sequence of linear programs and it's a pain to define, so I'm not going to do it. Right. So, and I, I think the speaker yesterday didn't really do it either and she had 20 minutes to talk about the nucleolus, so I think, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> okay, so cost of stability. So this is the minimum subsidy you need to stabilize the gain. So let me take a value quantity delta and let me modify my game by adding delta to the value of the grand collision, right? And now I'm asking, so what is the smallest, and all other collisions remain unmodified. Now I'm asking, what is the smallest delta, what is the smallest subsidy I need to throw in to make sure that my game is stable? Uh, uh, no, it's the, uh, ah, I see. Yeah, so these are dashes, sorry about those. Right, yeah, so, so they're just like the dashes above, right? <laughs> Right, yeah, we shouldn't have them in the formulas, sorry. Right. <laughs> right. So yes, yeah, so I'm asking what is the smallest subsidy I need. So if you do, so if I'm just interested in computing this quantity, right, so this is effectively also equal to the value of the weak least core for those of you who are familiar with that concept. Right? But kind of intuitively, kind of how much would I have to invest to make my game stable? Okay, so this is stability, a bunch of different concepts, all of them interesting, I believe. Fairness. Fairness is traditionally captured by the Shapley value, right? And the intuition is that this is the expected marginal contribution of a player kind of over arbitrary permutations of the players. Okay, so the idea, the idea is that players enter the room one by one in random order, right? And you ask, so suppose I enter the room, how much does this increase the value of the collision that is already in the room in expectation of all random orderings? Right? And so this can be captured by the following formula. Right, so this is a coefficient here to capture. So I wanted to write it in terms of a sum over collision rather than sum over permutations. Right, this gives me the ugly coefficient here. But what is important to notice is that the marginal contribution of a player, kind of to, to compute the Shapley value, you need to know the marginal contribution of a player to all possible collisions. Right, so this is what you care about. Okay, so again, kind of intuitively seems like it should be pretty difficult to compute. Okay, so this is a Shapley value. Okay, so now I can, I'm ready to show you some algorithms kind of for games and graphs. Right, so let me start with the most basic object, so the optimal partition. Right, so I have a collisional game on a graph with a small number of connected collisions, and I want to partition my players into collisions in an optimal way. Right, so this basic question was answered by kind of a group from Southampton, Tom Boyce, Gopal Ramchur, Nick Jennings, Amos 12 paper, and it's based on the following simple idea. So they have kind of much more than that in the paper, but this is the basic idea of the algorithm. Okay, so, so, so it's sort of easy to see that kind of, so we have these Demange games or Meyerson games, but it's sort of easy to see that for this question they're equivalent. Or in other words, we can assume that the optimal partition consists of connected collisions. Okay, so suppose we have an optimal partition for Demange game for simplicity, right? So imagine that this is your optimal collision. So each collision has a value. I want the partition that maximizes the total value. Hmm? So I can assume without loss of generality that all collisions are connected because disconnected collisions now have value zero and kind of you can make a similar argument for my Ocean game. So here's an important point. Uh, I claim that for some collision in the optimal partition, it holds that its complement is also a connected collision. It's fairly easy to see, so kind of one easy argument I can think of is take the 
condensed graphs or graph over collisions. Right? So you take the graph whose vertices are these connected collisions, CIs. You connect to if there is an edge between the respective vertices in the underlying graph. So you get some connected graph. You take a spanning tree in that graph and you take a leaf of that spanning tree, for instance. Right? So when you, when you remove a leaf from the spanning tree, you still get a connected graph on collisions. And this means kind of the complement is connected. Right? So that's one way to see it. Yeah, so I, yeah, so super edit. Yeah, so this is from, this is only interesting for non-super additive games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I can, so I, I can know for a fact that for some collision, for some connected collision in the optimal partition, it's, it's complement is also connected. And once I have that, I can do dynamic programming. Right, so to compute the value of a collision, I can consider all of its, all of its sub-collisions, compute the value, all of its connected sub-collisions, look at their values, look at, and kind of apply dynamic programming kind of on the complement, right? And this is sort of quadratic in the number of connected collisions, give or take, right? So not very difficult. Okay. Even practical on some real life networks apparently according, according to this paper. Okay, so this is optimal partition. So what about Chapley value, right? So for Dimanche games, it's really easy. So Dimanche games are the games where you disconnected collisions have value zero. So if I only have a small number of connected collisions, right? So a player, a player can only contribute when he is a member of a connected collision, when he, together with the collision, is connected. If the only polynomial many of those have polynomial many summons in my expression for the Shapley value, I'm good. So for my and games, it's slightly more interesting, right? So this is from an AMS 14 paper by, well, some people, some people who are in Oxford and also some people who are elsewhere. So Tomasz Michalak and Mike Muldrich are my colleagues at Oxford. Okay, so here's how it goes. So consider a collision, possibly disconnected collision. Consider a player in that collision. Right, I want to understand what is his marginal contribution to that collision. Well, his marginal contribution to a collision depends on, is determined by his marginal contribution to his connected component in that collision, to the connected component that he's sitting in. Right, so to the dark green guy here. Right, now, so let me, let, me look at this, let me look at this connected component that contains him. Right, so his marginal contribution to the entire collision is determined by that. Now I can sort of flip it over and ask the following questions. Uh, how, ma how many collisions are there in the graph? How many potentially disconnected collisions are there in the graph such that I's connected component is this collision? this green thing, right? And this is easy to compute, right? I take, how do I, bu how do I build these collisions? I take this green thing. Now I cannot take any of its neighbors because then I would have a larger connected component, but I can take any subset of vertices that doesn't include its neighbors, right? So if I take this collision and any set of vertices that doesn't contain the neighbors of the green collision, I get a collision in which I is connected component is this green collision. Right, then so I can count how many of those I have, and for each of them, the marginal contribution of player I is his marginal contribution to this collision. So I have to be slightly more careful to keep track of their size, but that's not very difficult either. Right, and with a bit more work, you actually get the closed form expression for Shapley value in graph connected games. So this is actually known as Meyerson's value. Right, so this, by the way, explains the term Meyerson. So Meyerson talked about computing Shapley values in graph-restricted games, and since that paper of his, so Shapley value in such games is usually called the Meyerson value. Okay, so again, this becomes easy. So let me talk briefly about one other algorithm. So the algorithm for computing the value of the least score. Right, so now let me, so I'm assuming throughout that the values of all collections are non-negative. Right, and if I have that, so in Dimanche games, I can simply ignore disconnected collisions. Right, so they're not going to be binding, so when I'm computing the value of the least score. Right, so and if I only have polynomially many connected collisions, so I have an LP with polynomially many constraints, I'm good. Right, so for Myers and games, interestingly, so the easiest way to compute the value of the least score is by reduction to optimal partition. Right, so here's how I'm going to proceed. Okay, so what do I need to do? I need a, so to compute the, computing the value of the least score is captured by the linear program that has exponentially many constraints. So I need a separation oracle, right? So the separation oracle needs to do the following. It's given a candidate payoff vector, x1 to xn. It's given a value epsilon, right? And it has to decide if there is a collision C, 
So if there's a, so let me reverse it. If there's a collision C whose deficit is more than epsilon, right? So who, that could get more than epsilon by dVAD. But right? the difficulty is that this collision may be disconnected, right? So it has several connected components. Each of them only gains very little by deviating, right? But if we throw them together, kind of overall together, they jointly they gain more than epsilon by deviating, right? So I need to find out if this is the case, right? And that boils down to optimal partition in the following way. So so I have my, my game, my Myerson game. Let me build a new game based on that, right? So in this new game, the value of each collision would be the, the deficit of a collision if the deficit is positive and zero otherwise, right? So kind of ma so max of zero and the current deficit, right? And now let me look at the optimal, optimal partition in, in this new collision, right? So I'm now asking if my new, if my new game admits a partition with value more than epsilon. So let me, so let me explain it visually, right? So I have, this, I have this original game, right? And I'm looking at the optimal way of partitioning it in this fashion, right? And let me mark with plus the collisions that actually have positive deficit and with minus the collisions whose deficit is negative, right? So suppose I can find such a partition, right? Now what is going to be my collision whose deficit is more than epsilon, right? Uh, this is the one that is taken by taking the union of the green guys, right? So these green guys together are the ones who jointly have a deficit of more than epsilon, right? So computing the value of the least core is effectively computing an optimal partition in a slightly different game. Okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to show kind of in my, as my answers to question one. Let me now talk about the structure. Mm-hmm, yeah. So with the separation of, you've only got a polynomial number of coalitions, so I can just set them directly. Uh, again, because I'm talking about the Meyer, Meyerson, Meyerson value, right? So the, the value of a disconnected collision is the sum of the components, right? So, so the situation I worry about is when, when my unhappy collision is a, is a bunch of disconnected, disconnected small collisions. So none, none of them alone can deviate, but together they can. Right, so each of them is gaining a little from deviation and to jointly they gain more than epsilon. Right, so this is a quirk of the definition of epsilon core, if you like. Okay, so, now, so this is my second question. So what are these, what are these graphs with a small number of, con of connected collisions? Okay, so preliminary observations, so something that Bernhardt already noticed. Right, so first, if I have a vertex of large degree, large meaning super logarithmic, then I'm already screwed. Right, so because I can take this vertex and any subset of its neighbors, I'm getting a connected collision. Right, so two to the power omega of log n is super polynomial. Okay, so this is bad. So here's another ob observation that is slightly less trivial. Suppose I have more than log n vertices, asymptotically more, of degree that is either one or at least three, non-degree two vertices. Then, uh, then again, m I'm screwed. Right, so where is that coming from? Well, so the basic idea is that you can, you can construct a spanning tree of your graph with the maximum number of leaves, right? And there is a bound, well, as always, to be found in an obscure Russian journal. For, so there is a very nice bound for maximum number of leaves uh, that basically says, so the paper actually gives a more precise result, but basically it says that if you have a, that you, if you have order, Okay, so if you have k vertices of degree, k is a bad, bad term, if you have s vertices of degree one or at least three, then you have a linear number of s leaves in the maximum in such a spanning tree, right? So you can always construct a spanning tree that has many leaves, if kind of linearly as many as you have interesting vertices, right? Then now suppose you have that, so you have this spanning tree with many leaves, what can you do now? Well, delete any, if you delete any subset of leaves of the spanning tree, Right, so what is left remains a spanning tree for the remaining graph. So what is left is still connected. Right, so if you can remove kind of any subset, right, and so you can, if you can remove any subset of leaves, you can remove any subset of leaves, you are still left with a connected graph. Right, so you have two to the omega of n options to remove leaves. Right, so you have many connected graphs. Okay, so now we are already getting some feeling for what these graphs look like. Right? They're not allowed to have many interesting vertices, so most of the vertices have degree two, but that in itself is not enough. 
Okay, so it's sort of okay, but this sort of suggests that vertices of degree two are the non-interesting ones. So let me try to get rid of them. So here's a definition that kind of gets us a bit further in understanding the structure of these graphs. So given a graph, I'm going to build a condensed graph, right? So condensed graph is the graph, effectively the graph you get by erasing vertices of degree two, kind of pretending that they're not vertices at all. But if you do that, you cannot completely ignore them, right? Because they're sort of useful for constructing connected subgraphs, right? If you have a longer path, you can take subpaths, right? So it's not a lot, but at least you get something out of it, right? So if I do that, I have to put some weights on there just to, to compensate for that. So this is how I'm going to do it. So let me say that n star is the set of my interesting vertices, vertices of degree other than two, right? Let me consider two interesting vertices. Now, between them, I have a path of non-interesting vertices. I want to collapse that path into a single edge, and I want to put a weight on it, right? And the way I do it is if I have a, if I have a path of length k, k nodes, I put a weight of log k plus one, right? So for this ugly flower over there, uh, we get a slightly less ugly flower by doing this, right? So these are the interesting words that are left, right? And these are the weights, right? So every edge of the original graph now has weight zero, Right, so this cycle of length four now has weight two. Right, so there, so each of the small cycles there has weight log three. Right, so logarithm is hopefully intuitive. Right, it sort of captures how many sets you are going to get out of it. Okay, so now let me rephrase my observation in terms of condensed graphs. Right, so my claim is that if the number of vertices of the condensed graph is super logarithmic, then I have many connected collisions. No, okay, so this bound is actually tight, right? So if I have, if I have at most n interest, if, if I have at most log n interesting vertices, so it may be the case that I'm only getting, I'm only getting polynomially many connected collisions, right? So that would be example, right? So the flower here has sort of log, log n, uh, kind of log n vertices, right? So the number of connected collisions here is polynomial. So in fact, right, so this num this n star, object doesn't kind of, okay, so if it's big, if it's more than log, if it's more than log n, my graph is bad, but if it's small, I cannot say anything. In fact, it, even if it's one, I can have a bad graph. I can have a graph with lots of connected collisions. So here is an example, right? So let's look at this flower, right? It has square root and petals with square root and vertices on each of those, right? And along each petal, I can walk an arbitrary number of steps, so I get square root and to the power of square root and super polynomial. Okay, so this, so this size of n star is not enough, so I have to do a reason about weights. And indeed, I can get bounds in terms of weights. Okay, so now from now on, I can assume that the number of, vertices, in, number of interesting vertices is at most logarithmic, because if I have more than I'm already done, right? So suppose I have fewer. Now, if also my weight is order of log n, then, the num then, I, then I'm actually good. Then the number of connected collisions is at most polynomial, right? And this is a constructive bound, right? So it's not, so you have these vertices, you have some edges between them with a smallish amount of weight on them, so I can sort of more or less enumerate all possible connected collisions. On the other hand, if my weight is more than log square of n, so there's a gap here, log n, log square of n. If I have more than log square weight, then already I have too many connected collisions. Right, so the argument, the argument is not very difficult here. So if I, so the weight of each edge is what? So the weight of every single edge is at most log n, right? Because it's the logarithm of the number of vertices on it. It's at most log n. So if my total weight is more than log squared, then I have more than log n positive weight edges, strictly more. I have log n vertices. So I can take a spanning tree, right? And kind of some of these positive weight edges will go into the spanning tree. But since I have so many of them, there will be still some left. And kind of from these, from these positive weight edges, I can choose arbitrarily whether to include them or not. Okay, so the weight turns out to be a useful parameter, but it doesn't go far enough. Let's look at these two graphs, right? So these are, in fact, trees. They're very similar, right? So they're very similar. So, so the n vertices all together, and they're partitioned between the kind of in one case, kind of the vertices are placed on the legs of the caterpillar. In the other case, they're placed on its spine, right? So these two graphs have the same number of interesting vertices. They have roughly the same weight. So give or take, you can, you can modify it slightly so that the weight is exactly the same, 
right? But one of these has polynomially many connected collisions, the other one has super polynomially many connected collisions. Which one is which? There's one with the words of the year, so this, is, so this one is bad, right? Number of legs, yeah. yeah. Right, so here you, ha yeah, and they're divided so that there's n over log n on each leg. Right, so here you have a lot of freedom. Right, so you take all of the spine and you decide how much to travel along each leg. Right, right, so n over log n to power log n. Right, and here you don't have quite as much freedom. Right, so basically you have to decide which segment of the spine you take. Right, and, and for each of the legs, kind of that is adjacent to the segment, you may take it or not. Right, and there are a few more choices. Right, so. Yeah, yeah. So the number of interesting vertices and they don't quite capture the complexity of this problem, unfortunately. Okay, so we can move further. So and okay, so this right. So there's still some gap between kind of low, be, okay. So here, okay. So the weight here, okay. So what are the weights here? It's okay. So logarithm of n over log n. So it's kind of somewhere between log n and log square n. Okay, so here's basically the decision diagram I can offer you. Okay, so first we look at the number of interesting vertices. If it's large, okay, bad, too many connected collisions. If it's small, we have to think further. So next we look at the weight. If the weight is small, if the weight is small, we are good. If the weight is large, right? Okay, so now suppose the weight is large. If it's really large, again we have an answer, super polynomial, right? And this is the remaining case. So in, in the remaining case, so we have to do a bit more work, right? And here is what we have to do, right? So it's not entirely satisfying because it involves enumeration, but it's sort of smallish enumeration, right? So we need to look at all subsets of interesting vertices, and for each subset, look at two, two quantities. Total weight of edges that touch it, and the weight of the minimum spanning tree, right? And the difference between these two has to be small. Right, and you can, you can go back to the example of the caterpillar and see that kind of one of the caterpillars satisfies it and the other one doesn't. Right, so this is my distinguishing criteria. Right, but it's annoying because it, it does boil down to computation. But hopefully, kind of for many families of graphs you are thinking about, kind of your decision diagram will stop somewhere before reaching this point. Right, so you will be able to see kind of which case you're in. Okay, so now finally, kind of in the last 10 minutes of my talk, so let me answer a question that possibly some of you are already thinking about. Some of you may be thinking, I mean, why do we have to go through all these kind of graph algorithms? So why are they even relevant? Is it perhaps simply the case that whatever easiness results we've seen in the first part of the talk, maybe they're simply coming from the fact that we have a small number of interesting collisions, right? So maybe this whole graph structure here is adhering, right? Because I'm not assuming much about the structure of the graph as such. I'm just assuming that it has a small number of connected collisions, right? So these are fundamentally the collisions that have values. The values of all other collisions are computed in some way, right? So either zero or computed kind of by summing things, right? So maybe if I just have a small number of, of interesting collisions, kind of I, still, I can still get all the easiness results. Well, let's, okay, so how would we make this claim formal? Well, so let's suppose that we have a game that is represented simply by a list of base collisions, right? So we have base collisions, and we have their values. Let's assume also maybe that the grand collision is a base collision and two singletons are base collisions because this is something that would be connected in any graph. Okay, and now, so the analog of Demange game would be to say that every other collision simply has zero value. But the analog of Meyerson game would be to say that the value of each collision is computed as the sum of the values of base collisions in its best, decomp best decomposition. Right, so this is by the way, known as synergy collision groups defined by Konitz and Sandholm back in 2004. Right, so this is actually a known representation formalism for collisional games. Right, so the question I want to ask, do our easiness results still hold? Do our easiness results, and we had a bunch of them, do they hold for synergy collision groups? Right, so if that was the case, so that would formally mean that kind of the graph structure here was adhering. Well, and it, yeah. Sorry? I know uh, it's hard to compute typically, right? Then, so we sort of circumvent it by saying that the, for the grand collision, the value is explicitly given. It partially circumvents this issue. 
But yeah, so this is a representation that is not computationally efficient, so you have to optimize to compute the value of the optimal collection. Right? And indeed, this partially answers the question. Right? So in particular, finding the optimal partition is in fact hard, whereas for graphs it was easy. Right? Okay, so what is known? For the core and the cost of stability, actually the, the answer is yes, right? And this is because we only have order of k constraints in our LP. Right? Okay, for optimal partition now the answer is no, right? So it's, it's hard to find the optimal partition of players into collisions, right? And this is a fairly trivial reduction from your flavor, favorite flavor of set cover, if you like. So exactly cover in particular, right? And it's pretty straightforward. Right, and this already shows that we actually do gain something from graph algorithms. So remember this dynamic programming algorithm I had. Right, so dynamic programming algorithm finding an optimal partition. Right, it didn't seem to use much about the graph. It just seemed to use the fact that there is an underlying graph and it has polynomial many connected collisions. Now I simply say, okay, I have polynomial many interesting collisions, but there is no underlying graph structure. Right? And that seems to make all the difference. Right? Just the very fact that there is a graph. Right? And without a graph, there is a hardness result. And similarly for the Shapley value, right? So I told you that there's an explicit formula if you assume graph structure, some graph structure. In the absence of graph structure, right, so it's not that difficult to show a hardness result again by reduction from exact set cover. And interestingly also for the least core you get a hardness result. Probably not too surprisingly because the algorithm we had for the least core was by reduction to optimal partition and optimal partition is hard in this setting. Right, so what is sort of interesting is that least for the least core, you get hardness. For the cost of stability, you get easiness. Or in different terminology, for the strong least core, you get hardness. For the weak least core, you get easiness. Right? This was sort of unexpected to me. But yes, yeah, so this is what you get. Right? So it seems like you need both a small number of interesting collisions and graph structure. Right? So both are important. Okay. So just a few words about kind of where else this parameter seem, makes an appearance. Well, it makes an appearance in hedonic games. You are going to hear more about hedonic games kind of later this afternoon, so in particular from Dominic. So here is a reason, some recent work I've done with another student of mine, Ayomi Garashi. So we talked about graph-restricted hedonic games. OK, so what are hedonic games? Here, players also form collisions, but instead of earning payoffs, they simply enjoy each other's company. Right? So I have preference over collisions I may join. Right? So this preference is potentially non-numeric. Right, so I just have preference. I'd rather be in this, this small collection rather than that big collection. Right? Okay, so now you can also put, put graph restrictions here. Right? So it's hedonic games, but each collection you can potentially form needs to be connected. Right? So I cannot be in a collection if I don't know anyone in that collection. Right? So here, so in that paper with Ayumi, so we get some algorithms, we, ha we have some algorithms that run in time polynomial in the number of connected collisions, right? And if we don't have that constraint, if you're, if you're interested in running, if you're interested in bounding running time as a function of the number of players, we get hardness results. Kind of depending on the solution concept, this can be PLS hardness results or NP hardness results. But anyway, so this seems to be the essential parameter. Right, so another question, uh, now not a cooperative game theory question, but the question where this parameter seems to make an appearance is finding a winning committee under certain committee selection rule for preferences that are single peaked on trees. And I realize that this sounds like gibberish to most of this audience. Right? But here's an example of another problem where this sort of parameter makes sense. So there's an algorithm, so there's an algorithm for this problem that is again polynomial in a number of connected collisions. Right? So my conclusions here are that this seems to be an important parameter, kind of number of connected collisions seems to be an important parameter in the analysis of kind of all sorts of games on graphs, right? So and many natural algorithms, so including the Manchester algorithms for non-superadditive games, I probably should have made it clear early, early in the talk, right? So it's an algorithm that comes naturally in the analysis of kind of games on graphs and other problems on graphs, right? And it's, I think it's useful to understand what are these graphs for which this parameter is small, right? And we sort of did that. I'm not completely satisfied with the characterization, so perhaps one could introduce a different parameter that would eliminate the need for some sort of exhaustive search and then right, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to see if someone could do that. But yeah, that's it. Let me stop here. Thanks.
No, the committee is not defined by the graph structure. So the voters' preferences are sort of driven by graph. So each voter has a favor. So the graph. Committee, the, the committee, committee is just selecting K candidates out of M many. No, so I think, yes, it's just a different use of the term. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, yeah. So, I think in this, for example, in the demand setting, all of a sudden, when the coalition happens to be disconnected, all of a sudden the payoff goes to zero. What if the, there should be some more graceful degradation based on how well connected the coalition was? By which I mean, to, you know, if the coalition has very high diameter, mm -hmm. then this way, so the people have studied classes of games where characteristic function was defined by the diameter or distance, but then it was just that, right? So the characteristic function would, would come all from these considerations only, rather than combining these considerations with someone else. So what you propose, I feel, is combining a more general characteristic function, just asking it to respect these conditions in some way. That I don't think has been done, so it might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so, the, so I'm aware of some work along these lines, so it may or may not match kind of the specific model, but something where the value of the collision is somehow determined by its geometry, yes. Okay, hmm. okay so Paul, I think you were first. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm asking more of my coalitions, okay, so the characterization would be different. Certainly all of these in this results would hold, right? So if I'm, ask, if I'm asking more of my coalitions, right, so yes, yeah, certainly I would have all these in this result. Maybe characterizing graphs on which there's a small number of such coalitions might be easier, so you may be, you may be able to get a cleaner characterization. So in that sense, it may be an interesting question. I don't know. More? Questions, complaints? <laughs>